Brian Richards, who is going to speak first, is a licensed clinical psychologist. He's a faculty affiliated investigator at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, where he works on, st on states of consciousness research at the Behavioral Pharmacology Research Institute. His specialty is acute outpatient care, diagnostic psychological testing, long-term care rehabilitation, drug and alcohol abuse, death and dying, spirituality and end-of-life care, mind mindfulness and brain science-based approaches to personal growth and healing, and therapeutic lifestyle change. I, it sounds like a list of things that we could all well use. Brian Richards. So today I'll be talking about managing high-dose psychedelic sessions. There we go. I'd like to start by just thanking and honoring our team and the very generous um, support we've had financially from a variety of groups, including um, the Council on Spiritual Practices, the Hefter Foundation, and the River Six Foundation. We really greatly appreciate their support. I'd like to begin also with the idea that as we go through our lives, we experience ourselves as unique and distinct human beings and develop a narrative or a story about who we are, often who we are relative to other people, comparing ourselves favorably or unfavorably to others. And that comprises the large part of our psychology or much of what we experience from day to day. Transcending that, moving beyond that or developing an awareness of being more than simply the thoughts that we have, really in many ways we can say is a remarkable developmental achievement and something that isn't true for everyone throughout the life course. And one of the reasons why psychedelics are such a powerful and potentially meaningful catalyst of personal change and growth. To quote a few remarkable human beings, Houston Smith, the human opportunity is to transform flashes of illumination into abiding light. Gurdjieff, were you to escape from prison, the first thing that you must recognize is that you're in prison. If you think you're free, no escape is possible. The Dhammapada Though one should conquer a million men on the battlefield, yet he indeed is the noblest victor who has conquered himself. It is in dying to the self that we are born into eternal life. Know thyself, and a contemporary Eckhart Tolle, the secret of life is to die before you die. So there's a confluence throughout centuries of this same theme of transcending, dying to the self, moving beyond the self, and psychedelics are certainly one catalyst for this process, a very powerful one, <coughs> and psilocybin is the compound that we're using at Hopkins. This is uh, one of a species of over a hundred different types of psychoactive psilocybin mushrooms, um, and really a remarkable compound to be working with. When a person goes on to ingest this compound <clears throat> in any dose, there are a variety of possibilities as to what can happen. That can include a potentially positive experience of psychodynamic early developmental insights, visionary or archetypal experiences of deities, angels, um, the wise old woman, other figures, animal spirits. Um, as well as mystical consciousness, which has been pretty well characterized in terms of moving outside of the personal self entirely into a state of bliss, of unitive experience, of transcendence of the categories of space and time. But also importantly, there are potentially negative experiences, <laughs> and it's really important to really take a look at those as well. Um, they're often part of what people experience, at least in part during a session, and some um, really continue to have a very difficult experience throughout. These can be experiences of terror, paranoia, and confusion, sometimes of delusional intensity that can occasion very erratic and potentially uh, really problematic behavior. And neutral as well, the sensory aesthetic experiences or synesthesias um, that are interesting um, but not particularly remarkable or transformative. This is a <coughs> photograph of our session room. You'll notice that 
The volunteer here is lying comfortably with eye shades and headphones. And we really invite people to continue to go inward throughout the session. And I often will tell volunteers that they have the rest of their lives to reflect on, write about, sing about, uh, be inspired by what they have experienced. But please have the experience. Um, and so we often really invite people to continue to go inward with a lot of support and guidance. So as a person goes inward, <coughs> sometimes they really encounter significant challenges. I'd like to read to you one really eloquently written report. What I remember about yesterday's session I did not feel any different for what seemed like an hour or so after taking the capsules. I was relaxing and enjoying the music. Eventually, I was feeling a bit disappointed that nothing would happen that day. Then very quickly, my torso felt a bit heavy. Then even more quickly, things were changing very rapidly in my mind. I seemed to lose awareness of my body almost immediately. The only content I remember on the way in was a sort of fun house atmosphere with a ticket agent and many voices, sounds, and the visual world was spinning and the ground was rolling. I remember looking into a fun house mirror and seeing that I was empty, hollow, not real, no insides, just a container, a skin. Then even that unraveled. I soon was scared that things were going too fast. The experience left me behind, and I was gone. I lost track of everyday reality, including myself. I could not tell up from down or even past from future. I went to pieces. Time went to pieces. Reality went to pieces. There was no continuity, none. I felt stuck outside of time like I would never be again, that I never was or will be. There were some occasional feelings of paranoia, like these people were causing pain. Some ideas of reference, like my thoughts at times were controlled by Mary and Bill. I did not recognize anything. At times, I did not recognize myself or time. I was unable to be present in the room. My only chance seemed to be to sneak back to reality. I remember wanting to go to the bathroom. I hoped somehow that the mundane experience would magically reaffirm reality. I was really lost, and no one seemed to appreciate what was going on. Bill and Mary went on very generously with the study, but the study, the experience, was terrifying. It seemed like an absurd occasion, all was chaotic absurdity. At times, I thought that perhaps I had exercised my will, and that might get me back. I imagined slicing through the craziness of the visual field and not finding anything but more chaos. I really wanted to get back to my life, to leave the room and be mundane again, but even these thoughts and desires slipped away. Everything slipped away. I could not discern what was in and what was out, or what was real and unreal. I felt exiled from all that I knew. I felt homeless, timeless, nameless, bodiless. There was no point of reference. I remember trying to focus or hold on to anything, memories, maps, places, rivers, people, sensations, feelings, names. Names were very powerful, my wife's name especially. Seeing a photo of us together brought a kind of transient comfort. As soon as the photo was gone, so was I. As soon as my reflection in the mirror was gone, so was I. Names, faces, feelings, desires, even pain and evil all became immensely desirable. I longed for my everyday existence. So certainly a compelling account of this kind of state of consciousness a person can encounter with psilocybin and certainly with many other hallucinogens. I would add that one remarkable finding that I can speak to anecdotally is that we've found that retrospectively, these volunteers really value having had 
this kind of experience, which is really extraordinary. They might say, I never ever want to go through this experience again, but I learned something from it. I can take a teaching, I can integrate something from this very difficult experience, which is really pretty remarkable. You'll notice that there is really an unpredictable time course for the effect of high dose psilocybin. This is a graph of minutes out to six hours and monitor rating of anxiety and fear <coughs> of five different volunteers. If you look at each one, you'll notice that there are there is one here that spikes late in the afternoon at which that person experienced peak anxiety. So it really doesn't follow what we would expect in terms of someone taking a drug and then having a particular effect um, throughout the day. Sometimes it's late in the afternoon that a person then goes on to experience significant anxiety. And it's really at those times that also the guides really need to be carefully attuned to what's going on with the person and invite them to really express what they're experiencing and offer a pr support in a way that is appropriate and helpful. So some of the guidelines, we have our volunteer selection, personnel and environment, preparation set and setting, um, and then I'll talk a bit about what we do during the session and also after the session. Our volunteer selection includes conducting a really thorough psychiatric interview we will exclude anyone with a history of schizophrenia, psychosis, bipolar 1 or 2 disorder, as well as anyone with a first or second degree relative with either of these disorders, in part because we want to rule out anyone who might have a brain disorder or disease process, anyone also with a history of suicidal ideation or self-injury, as well as current severe depression. We spend at least five hours with the volunteer in order to really build trust and support with them, um, really discussing their personal history and worldview. And we do a lot to, in a sense, cognitively inoculate them. <clears throat> I'll have significant time with them talking about, as well as some of the other people involved in the study, like Roland Griffiths, really talking with the volunteers around how to encounter fear and meaningfully work with that. Um, the broad range of experiences that are possible with hallucinogens, and specifically for each person, what they would most find fear-inducing, what they most don't want to think about, what seems unspeakable, unknowable, unthinkable, really to be open to encountering that, learning from it, and seeing that as potentially a beneficial or something that can be managed during the session itself. So lots of instruction. And <clears throat> I guess when we invite people to surrender to, I want to honor how difficult that really is. Um, but we really invite people to think of acceptance of the experience itself, whatever it is that they encounter. We have a mantra we give people that we invite them to even repeat or remind them of to trust let go and be open. And very importantly, the idea of moving forward and into rather than avoiding or engaging in a aggressive way, really continuing more and more deeply into the experience, whatever it may be. And importantly, to let go of self-consciousness and really allow catharsis to take place if that's a part of the person's experience. So. I'll have some dialogue with volunteers around how they may experience their body very differently. Um, there may be an impulse towards movement. I can think of one person who had an absolutely rapturous, ecstatic, kundalini-type experience where he was arching his back and just completely suffused by the experience during a um, playing of the Russell Paul uh, Vedic um, piece that we include um, that was particularly meaningful for him. And I'm glad that he felt comfortable enough to really fully lose himself in the experience. So we spent a lot of time helping people feel very natural with us and not guarded and to invite them to just let go of any fear of being judged or valued or criticized in any way. So really a lot of non-judgment and compassion frames the work that we do. Also explaining session expectations and logistics and modeling supportive touch. Really being clear about what kind of therapeutic touch is 
therapeutic and helpful when the person might not want any touch whatsoever. Um, that can be hand-holding, and there are some volunteers who have asked that we be there present with them by their side and holding their hand for hours throughout the session. Other volunteers who want relatively little physical contact, no hand-holding, and it's important that we understand what's helpful to them and what their needs are. Um, and also, sometimes people find that it's very difficult to mobilize speech with a high dose, and so we ask that they have a signal or something to communicate their need. Can they lift their finger or in some way telegraph to us what would be helpful so that we can understand without intruding on their experience or um, acting in a way that isn't helpful? So the personal, <coughs> personnel and environment include two guides, ideally a male and a female, who are really quite familiar with reported hallucinogen effects and altered states of consciousness, are grounded in who they are as unique human beings, emotionally attuned, non-judgmental, self-aware, sincere, very importantly have clear professional boundaries, and um, I can think of no better way to say this, but ideally not a lot of ego. Um, so the people involved in providing support as guides really need to set their own personal needs aside and be emotionally attuned and present in a way that is sincere um, and truly helpful to the person. To have the ability therapeutically to engender trust in this volunteer on a deep level and develop a trusting therapeutic relationship. And factors that facilitate positive psychodynamic Visionary and mystical experiences include set, um, the person's orientation, attitudes, and life history, as well as vital variables that really often aren't emphasized sufficiently. Um, do they have an intention or would they like to create one? What are they asking of life? What would they hope to experience? How do they hope to grow and develop as unique human beings? A sense of ritual of this being something that is unique and potentially very powerful and profound and can they engage with this experience in that way um, respect for the experience itself that it might be very challenging um, there may be remarkable anxiety and fear towards the onset of the drug effect and that fear may happen later in the day um, but really to be prepared for a deep inner journey the setting, environmental and interpersonal, um, to have a very comfortably furnished space, and dosage, the physiological factors, um, what the actual dose range is, has a dramatic impact on the person's subjective experience. So the set, including an unconditional trust, an ability to form a meaningful therapeutic relationship, a personal choice to take a leap of faith to really surrender into this experience with openness, self-compassion, um, the courage to let go of control, to go beyond simply understanding, being more than thinking about, experiencing, more than simply discussing or talking about. And one really powerful idea is just to be the witness to your experience, which is really quite profound. Um, if you're being torn apart, if you're going crazy, if you're dying, that aspect of you that is the witness to this entire experience. And in that space as the witness, perhaps this is not such a big deal and it's something that really can be meaningful and very profound. The setting, um, emphasizing volunteer and patient safety, confidentiality, that all that they experience, all that they discuss with us is entirely confidential. Aesthetically supportive, it's very comfortable and warm. People can recline on a couch throughout the day. There's a pillow, blankets, evocative and supportive music, and also to create their own space. So we really invite volunteers to bring with them photographs, meaningful spiritual objects that may be grounding or anchoring, um, books that they've read that had particular meaning and even put them throughout the space so that when they open their eyes They might be comforted or reminded of someone from their past or something that is really helpful to them 
and the interpersonal process, um, empathic, respectful, and genuine throughout, but also in a very practical way, focused and present with the volunteers. Possible high dose effects include, of course, motor impairment, disinhibition, dissociation, and nausea. So sometimes physically supporting the volunteer or making sure they have adequate balance as we support them, for example, going to the bathroom. Um, they, there is a private bathroom which is part of this suite, and so there isn't the intrusion of people who are not involved in the study at any time during the day. Um, thought process can intensify in a way that is not helpful um, and become even delusional. The person may become more suspicious towards the guides or the studies, and experience some perceptual distortion. So as we think about that event, we simply continue to maintain safety and very clear interpersonal boundaries, remove potentially dangerous items. We'll often encourage the volunteer to lie down on the sofa and support walking them to the bathroom or orienting them to the environment to um, give them a sense of the space. And sometimes I'll also telegraph or verbalize movement and let them know what I'm doing and continually emphasize my effort to be helpful to them. So in leaving the session room, we have a same gendered guide who will stand outside the bathroom and do one minute checks. Um, before the session, we'll also ask the volunteer if they would please give us their shoes and mobile phone. We'll provide slippers to help create a space, but also in a very practical way to do, discourage them from eloping. Um, I can say that there may be that impulse or that tendency, but the drug is here and the experience is here. And so no matter where they go, there they are. Um, so I'll sometimes say that to them, here we are now, and so let's make the most of it and see what you can take from this experience. Face the demon. The present moment is your teacher. Um, you can have both fear and courage at the same time. Simply be here now. So we have a physician on call, two guides present throughout the session, um, limit contact with others. Um, pharmacological intervention as needed, although I'd like to emphasize that we've never needed to administer a benzodiazepine sedative or an antipsychotic medication. Um, we ensure the volunteer doesn't leave the study site, and we have music playing throughout. After the session, uh, the volunteer is take, taken safely home or stays overnight with the monitor on call. If that's me, I'm available by mobile phone 24 hours. We have a following follow-up meeting the second morning um, with the monitors and we invite them to really write about their experience and continue to develop it and gain insight from it. So to be the witness, your breath is always with you even if you feel that you have died, even if you feel that you are going crazy. Ask what it has to teach you. Convey love and acceptance to that aspect with, which seems so alien or so frightening. If it's a vicious animal, feed it, nourish it, hug it, show it love, and see if it transforms and becomes a guide or a support to you. And to credit Ann Shulgin, the idea, and this is very important, as you encounter something that seems so frightening, not only to engage with it in a positive and meaningful way and ask what it has to teach you and what it's doing here in your mind, but also to enter into it and look out through its eyes. So I'd like to re <clears throat> read one other quote of a volunteer who really kind of followed that idea through a challenging experience. And this is what she said as she wrote about what she had experienced. That in every horrible experience or frightening experience, if you stay with it, enter into it, you will find God, that the horror is in reality only an illusion and God lies beneath it all. It has become a guiding principle in my life. Thank you. This is a duet. And uh, the second part is Mary Cosimano, whom I've been very much looking forward to hearing. The second part of this duet is Mary Cosimano, whom I've been very much looking forward to hearing speak. 
She's with the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Johns Hopkins University, and she served as a study guide and research coordinator for the psilocybin studies for over a decade. She's been a, second, a session guide for over 200 psilocybin sessions. Mary Casamano. Hello, everybody. I'm Mary, Hi. <laughs> I'm Mary Casamano, and um, you know, since I have been here, there have been so many things that I think, oh, I want to say this now, and I want to say this now, and, and then I hear this speaker, and it reminds me of something else, and um, so it's, it's just difficult, because there's so much to say, and, um, and, and I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm going to be reading most of it, um, because I have a lot to cover, and because um, I'm nervous. But I think I'm going to start with this, because um, what, well, I'll introduce myself. Mary Casamana with Johns Hopkins. Um, been with um, the studies since we started the psilocybin studies about 13 years ago. I've been involved in the clinical and the research components of our five psilocybin studies as well as some of our other hallucinogen studies. Um, I've been a guide in almost 240 sessions and I, I am continually fascinated by our volunteers' experiences. In fact, the more that I guide, the more that I realize um, just am overwhelmed with um, the beauty and the intimacy of being with them. Um, so I'm going to continue to discuss how to manage difficult psilocybin sessions from the standpoint of research coordinator and primary guide. Um, as Brian and some of my colleagues have said, and as many of the other speakers have said, um, that one of the key components of ensuring an optimal psilocybin experience is development of trust and rapport, um, and thereby it helps to manage difficult psilocybin sessions. Um, if someone is having a very difficult psilocybin session, the more trust they have in their guides and the whole study, the more that they're likely to move through the difficult parts. And so um, one thing that I like to say, and I would like to say to you, um, usually in my mind with the volunteers, I'm going to say it out loud to you, um, because it helps me to begin that process is um, I welcome you with open arms. And I mean that that we're here together. Once you're with us, we bring you in and we want to make you a part of our family, a part of our team. So let me click the slide. So today I'm going to be giving an outline of phone screening, in-house screening, preparatory meetings, and a couple of volunteer case studies. I also just want to say that there are things you're going to hear, similar to things that Brian have said and others have said. Um, I'll probably say it in a little bit of a different way, but I also have heard, and um, hopefully it's true, because you might be hearing it for the third or fourth time, you have to hear something three times before it stays with you. So if you've heard it at one or two or three times, just realize that that's good. That's a good thing. Um, we often think developing this trust begins with the volunteer um, when they've been assigned, assigned their guides and they begin their preparatory sessions. But while the guides do have the most intense relationship in this process, developing the trust begins with the volunteer's first contact with us, and that, of course, is the phone screen. Um, often just picking up the phone to make that initial call can be a challenge, um, and particularly if this is true of our cancer study patients, volunteers. Therefore, making them feel at ease is very important. Letting them know that they're being heard is equally important, and that requires active listening. And then the phone screening. If a person qualifies over the phone, the next step is, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, the next step is the in-house screening. Um, this is their first in-house meeting with us, and providing a welcoming and safe atmosphere is the next step to building the trust. This two-day screening process is thorough and time-intensive for many reasons, but one of the most important is to discuss with them that while there is minimal risk of physical harm to the body or psychological or physical dependence, there can be concerns regarding the psychological risks of these compounds. Of course, Brian talked a bit about that in a little more detail. Once they have qualified, 
They're enrolled in the study and assigned two guides who are with them throughout the study, conducting the preparatory meetings, the psilocybin sessions, and the follow-up meetings. As I have said, the guides have the most intense relationship with the volunteer, but the entire study team is part of their experience. The more that they become familiar with all of us, the more likely they can trust the whole process. So during the screening visits, they meet with Roland, Matt, our principal investigators, as well as many of the team members. Our goal is to make them feel part of the whole team, which of course they are. I am, sorry, so you can look at me up real quick. Okay. Um, as with the previous procedures, our preparatory meetings are also very thorough. The spacing of these meetings vary depending on whether the volunteer is local or out of state. The number of preparatory hours is between five and 10. And basically, there are two components to these meetings. One is discussing the logistics of their two psilocybin sessions and the other is preparing them for the psilocybin sessions. Okay. So logistics topics include information such as foods and medications to avoid before and after the session, arrival time, what to wear, comfortable clothes, what to bring, items to make the room their own, such as pictures, sacred objects, special or comfortable cozy blankets. Note taking, the guides take notes for them throughout the session. Fire alarm and blood pressure guidelines. We let them know that we, that we begin the session day. When we begin the session day, we give them a pair of slippers and we take their shoes and their cell phones. This is to help them let go of the outside world and of control. For us, it's a safety measure it makes it more difficult to leave the study site. Safety medications are located in a locked box in a room, and a physician is always within five minutes of the session room in case of emergency. Okay. And as you've heard, um, also covered are knowing the format of the day, which is eye shades and headphones, reclining on the sofa, and listening to a six and a half pl hour playlist designed for a high-dose psilocybin session. We have them actually put on the eye shades and headphones, lie on the sofa, listening to a selection from our playlist. This is done during the preparatory meeting, so it's not new, a new experience on the day of the psilocybin session. And that um, really makes a big difference if they've um, experienced it beforehand. It also helps familiarize them with the session room and the location of the private bathroom. Recently, we had a volunteer who had become disoriented when she was in the bathroom. Because of her experience, we realized that we needed to um, amend the protocol, and it included removing the lock, keeping the door open a couple inches, and verbally checking in with them every minute or less. I recently had a volunteer who had completed her first session, but before her second session, these new procedures were in place. At our pre-session meeting, I told her the bathroom procedures, and she was not only fine with it, but she realized that it enhanced her safety. Being thorough and clear on the logistics is as important as the preparation for the psilocybin sessions. If the volunteer knows what to expect, and that we have taken the utmost precautions, that helps them to feel more comfortable and safe, allows them to let go, which is key to having a positive experience. again and you know all about that okay so preparing for the sessions the second part of the preparatory meetings is designed to prepare a person for the psilocybin sessions as I've said gaining the volunteers trust and establishing rapport are of prime importance this is accomplished by having them share their life experiences their joys and their sorrows and especially their fears anxieties, and embarrassments. We often ask them to tell us what is their most, most fearful or anxiety-producing thought and to tell us that. This way, if this very personal material comes up during the psilocybin session, they have already talked about it and they're more likely to move through it. 
This requires a letting go of control, which is key. We introduced the TLO mantra, as Brian said, and um, this helps with that. Um, trust, let go, be open, trust us, trust the study design, trust yourself, let go, let go of what you want to happen, let go of what you think should happen, and be open, be open to whatever comes up. In fact, we encourage them to welcome it. It's a little bit of shift in the way that we often think about difficult experiences or fear going into it, but it really is, as you've heard many of us say, it's you want to welcome this because if you um, have that um, way of looking at it, it's a good thing. If it's in there, you want it to come out. And so that's a lot of our preparatory meeting is welcome it. This is a great thing. Um, explore it. What can it teach me? Um, so that's really important, I believe. Um, we remind them to breathe and to relax, and we ask them if they have any particular words or techniques that help them to relax. And I recently had a volunteer, and she said to repeat, be still and know, because that was something that helped her to relax and um, you know, helped her to get through the session if needed. And, and I did that a few times. Um, we want them to feel comfortable and cozy. We want them to know that their safety and comfort is our primary goal. Here we emphasize that the, the, not, the only way that we'll know this is by them telling us. Do they want more blankets or flu fewer blankets? Do they want the music louder or softer? Do they want physical contact or no contact? We talk about how touch can be reassuring and can allow them to go deeper and to go further. Or just to have that contact when you're feeling emotional, scared, joyful, um, just to have that grounding so that you can just take off can be really powerful. We familiarize with the, them with this reassuring touch during the psilocybin preparation sessions. And that way, if they've um, had that contact, because some people the first time are not comfortable with that. Most are, but some are not. And so we practice that in the prep sessions when we have them lying on the sofa. And, um, and oftentimes on the day of the session, um, they welcome that and they put their arm out. We said, you know, we don't, sometimes we'll just take their hand, not thinking necessarily anything is wrong, but just to say we're here. Um, but if we don't, give us your, you know, p just put it out there, ask us or put it out if you don't want to break what's going on. You don't even have to talk. But, and if we take it and you don't want it, let us know that too. Um, again, let us know what is going to make you most comfortable. The meetings always begin with a mention that these are things that we have experienced over the years and may or may not happen to you, but it really is important to give them as many scenarios as possible so that if it comes up, they've heard it before. That really is powerful. We've, had, we've heard that many times, as I will show you here. Um, these measures are extremely important to help ensure their physical and psychological safety, and therefore we cover them quite, quite thoroughly in our preparatory meetings. Um, as I was reading over volunteer session reports, I noticed in almost every one there was a mention of the benefit of these preparatory meetings. And so I have a few quotes to, um, to show you that. Okay, this was our first volunteer. I lay down under the covers. Mary put on the headphones and mask, and I began to sink deeper and deeper into the bed. Down, down, down I went under the covers of my childhood. Mary held my hand and created contact. I thought the contact was there to create support so I would not get overwhelmed. While that was through, true some of the time, what I felt was true most of the time is that it was more necessary to help me stay in my body, while at the same time, my body dissolved. Through the contact, I was able to be in both worlds at the same time. Hence, my whole experience can be integrated and carried through with me into the denser planes of reality. And later on, she said, the beauty of it all started to feel overwhelming, and I felt Roland's words, the mind plays tricks in many ways. And I remembered our discussion about overwhelm possibly being one of those tricks. Okay, um, the second volunteer. Um, my first experience today, 
seemed to originate out of Brian covering me with the blanket. This gradually transformed into the vision and sense that Bill and Brian and I were covered by a blanket-like net that linked us together emotionally and mentally. Next volunteer. Had it not been for the two experienced researchers in the room, I probably would have had a full-blown panic attack and lost the larger experience. Next volunteer. When scary thoughts came, I stayed, tried to welcome them, said bring it on in my mind, really wanted to go there, always knew I would come back, boomerang. So a couple things about that last quote. Um, this last volunteer's quote addresses a number of the issues that we do discuss in the preparatory meetings. When dealing with scary thoughts, we encourage them to stay with it, to bring it on, and again, actually to welcome it. We remind them that they're always safe, that they will always come back, no matter how far out they go. We use the boomerang as the example. The same force that takes you deep within will, of its own impetus, return you safely back. In other words, no matter how far out you go, you'll always come out, always come back, the boomerang. And this is not unusual. I found this in the first four session reports that I read. We hear it over and over again. And it's important to note that it's not only the guides that are mentioned, but Roland and other team members as well. Again, it reinforces the importance of the whole team. So now I'd like to share with you two case studies. Okay, the first one is reliving surgeries. A 46-year-old female married with four children. She had an extensive history of physical illness, trauma, and pain in her life. In addition to her cancer diagnosis, followed by a year of chemotherapy, she had 10 surgeries and four childbirths, three of which she had no anesthesia. Very shortly into the session, after she lay on the sofa, she felt as though she were out of control, in pain, and worried about Bill and my safety being with her. In her words, she said, I became so completely focused on Mary's safety that I kept begging her to leave. Sorry, I keep going that way. Um, she then began to psychologically relive her surgeries. Yet in her state of mind, she was reliving them physically. Her psychological turmoil seemed to approach agony. She had continual flashes of operating room, labor pain, difficulty breathing, and a pounding heart. She felt as if she were going to die. She was screaming, writhing, crying, yelling, and she wanted it to end. She wondered why Bill and I would do this to her, to allow her to go through this. For over an hour, Bill and I supported her by providing her with continual reassurance, both verbally and physically. It seemed endless to her as well as to Bill and to me. Um, but, we, but gradually her pain did begin to subside. She found she was focusing on her children and her husband with so much love and how specifically each were important to her, that they were her life's purpose. She was grateful to have her life back. In the next day session report, she wrote, I became more accepting of the experience and a great catharsis started. She talked about how out of character it was for her to be so extreme and expressive of her emotions, screaming, crying, and yelling at Bill and me, basically giving voice to her feelings. She said, I am normally quiet and reserved and have never railed against the enormity of the pain I have had to endure. I just politely, with dignity, accept my fate. There was nothing dignified or polite about me during the reliving of my traumas. I believe there was a great deal of expression and release of the pain. Bill and Mary were great supporters and faced my pain with me. I wasn't alone like I had been so many times before. Being supported helped me to let go. This volunteer session taught me 
the value of staying with the experience, no matter how difficult it may be. It reinforced the importance of being there for the volunteer, offering whatever support is needed. In this case, continual reassurance, both verbally and physically. We gave her the space she needed to express her feelings. And as always, we reminded her that she is always safe. Uh, the second case study, the 12-hour session. This volunteer was a 41-year-old male, married with two children. He had stage four pancreatic cancer with metastases to the liver. Coming into the study, he had an overwhelming fear of death, mainly due to the fact that he had two young sons. He felt that there were three distinct parts to his experience. The first part of his session began with him lying on the sofa very still. He was very quiet, and when we would check in with him, asking how he was doing, if, anything, if there was anything he wanted us to share, he would briefly answer that he was fine, that he wanted to share, but later. This lasted for a few hours. Then he got up for a bathroom break. He shared little with us then, but he said he was and had had experience of peace, love, and perfection. In the next day session report, he wrote of that time. Um, let's see. He wrote in the next day session report. I'm out in the universe. My consciousness is accelerated, moves forward at incredible rate. Um, the last burst takes me to a place <clears throat> where all is peaceful. <clears throat> Every need is satisfied. Everything is perfect. It is a place you go when you return to the bigger whole. I want to stay there. I see white light like lightning passing over a still lake. I don't know if it is an angel or God, but I see a figure materialize out of a purple cloud. The figure is made of blinding light and is fully formed and moving. After the bathroom break, he lay back down, and as he put it, I fully expected that my experience had run its course at this point. I thought that I would return to the couch, relax, and enjoy the music. But this is not how things worked out. In fact, the opposite occurred in what he called the second part of his session. The following is how he described the experience in his next day session report. The music had an overwhelming physical presence. It is pounding me physically. As I let go and get a, to a calm place, only to find myself picking something up that results in more beatings. This cycle continues for a long time. The beatings from the music is very intense. I really want it to end. Rather than talk to my guides about it, I keep going inward, but the beating cycle continues. It feels like being kicked and stomped by a large gang of people. The blows are felt more generally than specifically. I start to feel some resentment or animosity toward my guide. I want it to end, and I know that they will want it to continue. My left arm is jerking uncontrollably and violently at times. I can't believe my guides can't see this. My body is so animated. In reality, he was lying perfectly still. I can see the impact of the blows from the music on my body. It feels like I'm jumping around. It feels like my chest is caving in. The music's bombardment makes it very difficult to breathe. I feel tons of pressure on my chest. We break and I sit up. I want desperately for it to be over. My emotional balance is completely destroyed. Mary suggests that the best way to get through it is to lie back down. It's the last thing I want because I don't want to face the music anymore. Yet he lay back down and then the third part unfolded. He stayed with it and felt, as he put it, emotionally overwhelmed, hysterical explosive laughter one second, weeping the next. For the next few hours, 
He had vivid imagery and experienced what he said in the end led to feelings of resolution with himself and with the world. At his one month follow up, he said, um, he continued to, the experience continued to be extremely powerful and that his anxiety and extreme sadness due to his cancer diagnosis had decreased significantly. He stated, in a way, it gave me back everything. At his six month follow up report, he said, my place in the universe was made clear and now I have the ability to put down the negative, to live more actively, and to have more compassion for myself. For most of his session, Fred and I really didn't know what he was experiencing. And in the case of the second part, he was going through hell. We had no idea. It wasn't until the end of the day, he said he felt like he was in a trash can and being beaten and battered for hours, and he couldn't get out. He said he realized it was his cancer he was battling, and when he let go of fighting it, the beating stopped and the peace came. So some observations from these two case studies. Um, from these two studies it, and others that I have witnessed, it demonstrates that psilocybin experiences can and do vary dramatically. It is easily seen in the difference of these two sessions I just described. In the first, the volunteer was extremely verbal and expressive, and we knew exactly where she was, what she was experiencing and feeling. For the majority of the time, she needed constant reassurance, both verbally and physically. As the second volunteer's experience, he was physically still and silent. Although we provided some initial physical contact, hand-holding, the majority of the time, he preferred to be on his own. For this reason, it is important that the guides treat every session as if it were a high dose of psilocybin session with an alertness and awareness that no matter what a volunteer is expressing outwardly, um, still stay with them, give them their attention. Uh, another variable is if and when a person is going to have emotional experiences and what form it may take. I've seen in many sessions where the volunteer goes from laughing one moment to sobbing the next. In the last case description, the first few hours was traumatic, the next two hours, vivid imagery, and the last were feelings of resolution. Therefore, guides must constantly be reassessing the, ses reassessing the sessions and be aware that at any time, emotions and feelings can and do um, change from one moment to the next. Another variable is the length of the psilocybin sessions. Um, experiences. While most session effects are over at around six hours, we certainly have seen those that have ended sooner and lasted longer. Again, looking at the case I just read, the effects continued vividly for three additional hours, and it was only then that he experienced resolution. Again, reinforcing the importance of the guides being mindful and remaining alert and aware and constantly be reevaluating the session. And finally, and I said this earlier, the more sessions that I guide, the more I realize that I really don't know what any one volunteer's experience is going to be. And again, um, it speaks to the uniqueness of the individual, the uniqueness of these substances, and, um, and I just have to say how grateful I am to be in this study, grateful for all of you, for all of our funders, um, my team, um, because being a part of these experiences um, over the years, I realize how much importance it has for me. And um, you know, if I can say one word, um, and we talk, Tony talked about this. All, many of us talk about this. We hear this over and over and over. The main theme of what is going on here is really love, and it's about getting to that true self. That true self that we are is love. And when we remove all of those barriers, all the walls that we have built up, when in our preparatory meetings, when we allow our volunteers to feel safe so that they can, they can begin to remove these, um, you know, these walls, these masks that have been closing down their true self, um, they, re they begin this process of removing them. And then you give them the psilocybin, 
and then you open it up and, and the experience is that, that this is my true self, this is love, and it is those transcendent um, experiences when you are connecting with love, whether it's yourself, other people, the, the ground, the animals, flowers, it's the feelings of love and gratitude and unity and oneness and, and joy and awe and um, sense of the sacred. And um, I have the, the honor of being with that so many times. And um, all of you are reasons that I'm able to do that. So I thank you so much. Um,